Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and in all our dangers and necessities, stretch forth our right hand to help and defend us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, we are with uh, Dr. Leslie Williams, emblem of faith untouched, a short life of Cranmer. Page one. Introduction, Emblem of Faith Untouched, is a biography written for those interested in Thomas Cranmer and the English Reformation, but who are, for, who are not professional scholars in the field. Jeremy McCulloch's brilliant and in-depth study provides a compendium of information about Cranmer addressing scholars' contradictions about Cranmer's life, motives, and personality, as well as his effect on the development of the Anglican Church. I'm deeply indebted to McCulloch for providing such a comprehensive and factual study. This book is a text for seminarians, priests, and lay students of English history and theology and of the development of the Anglican Episcopal Church. Though the book includes the theology and history of the period, it's primarily anecdotal in focus, telling the stories of Cranmer's life. Originally based on John Fox's narrative in the Acts and Monuments, this current biography tends to view Cranmer's martyrdom from the Anglican perspective but includes information from all other biographical sources, including the Roman Catholic view, thus making Thomas Cranmer as human and real as possible. For a smoother read, all quotations, ideas, events, dates, and facts are documented in the beginning. Chapter 1, Beginnings. Grant to us, we beseech thee, the spirit to think and do always that which is rightful, that we, which cannot without thee, may be able to live according to thy will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Chapter 1, The Beginnings. The quaint modern town of Aslockton lies on the edge of a fertile vale in Belvoir in the Midlands of England. Surrounded by farmland and patches of forest. According to current locals at the Cranmer Arms pub, the village boasts a population of around a thousand people, housing one of England's few remaining blacksmiths and farriers. Visitors can take hiking tours by the river along the same footpaths Thomas Cranmer himself walked 500 years ago. In 1500, the land was an ancient town, as Lockton in North Nottinghamshire looked much as it did when Robin Hood roamed and ruled in nearby Sherwood Forest three centuries earlier. In Cranmer's time, Major Oak, Robin Hood's legendary headquarters, still spread its majestic branches and birches along with long, gangly silver trunks provided shade for emerald grass and winding footpaths. The remains of an old Norman moat and wattle castle with a moat had disintegrated into a mound, forming the gardens, the pleasure grounds of the Lord, Pri Lord Private Manor, Thomas Cranmer Sr. His young son, Thomas used to sit on top of the mound and gaze toward the gardens and meadows around him, listening to the bells of St. John of Beverly in nearby Watton. Thomas Cranmer, Jr. was born on November 2, 1489, in Aslockton, an estate with a rich history land that had been a Roman settlement belonging to King Edward until the Norman conquest of 1066. As recorded in the Doomsday Book, William the Conqueror himself had given the estate to William de Aincourt, 
for the Battle of Hastings, one of the three original manors in the parish that came into the hands of the as Lockton family during Henry II's reign. Simon de Aslockton served as sheriff of Nottingham during 1260 and part of 1261. In 1460, Cranmer's grandfather, Edmund, married the last surviving heir, Isabella de Aslockton, and the estate with manor passed into the Cranmer hands. Located in the center of the village, the estate covered 500 to 600 acres, including meadows and forest lands. The population of the village was surrounded, was around 40 people, with 18 living outside the settlement. The old Aslacton Mound provided the high ground for the gardens and is now called Cranmer's Mound in honor of the young boy who used to sit there. Edmund's marriage to Isabella de Aslockton was a step for him. She came from a knighted family, and Edmund, arriving from nearby Lincolnshire, aspired to a higher social status. Though the Cranmer wealth was modest compared to that of other estates surrounding Aslockton, a desire toward upward social mobility passed from Edward to his son, Thomas, the father of Thomas the Archbishop. Thomas Sr. called himself Esquire in his will and chose to be buried in the larger, grander parish church of Watton instead of the smaller chapel of Holy Trinity in Aslockton. Half a mile away, the village of Watton had grown up around one of the other three original estates, and St. John of Beverly was the main church in the parish. The family, Cranmer family worshipped in Watton, although the father, Archbishop's father left the small chapel in as, as Lockton, a little something in his will. A footpath leads from the center of modern as Lockton to Watton, beginning a couple of hundred yards from the Cranmer's Mound, traveling along a hedgerow over a stile to the river and offering a glimpse of the Watton church standing high over the river banks. Because Thomas Cranmer's family dated back to the Norman Conquest in 1066, family members had the right to a family crest and coat of arms. British heraldry was a holdover from medieval times when a coat of arms, a literal coat worn over the armor of knights, was essential for quick recognition in battle. At first, knights could choose their own symbols and colors but the situation soon devolved into pandemonium and an organized system took over, with the king granting all arms. The family is selected from two medals, gold and silver, and up to seven colors with symbolic attachments, red for military strength, blue for loyalty, green for hope, black for grief or constancy, orange for ambition, maroon for patience in battle, and purple for royalty. By the time Cranmer became Archbishop of Canterbury, property was also required as a qualification for coat of arms or crest. Though the need for instant battlefield identification had passed with the code of chivalry, the ancient custom appealed to those who wanted to be identified with social status. By 1501, Thomas Sr. had died behind his wife, three sons, and leaving behind three sons and four daughters who were faced with the issue of the tomb.
grateful to have had the privilege of burial among glorious knights and clergy of old. The family didn't know how to compete with ornate tombs and effigies of the greater estates around them. They selected a simple, unextravagant limestone slab for Thomas and cut it with a life-size engraving of him in plain clothes with long hair and a purse. At the same time, they included two crests on the family tomb, the family shield, a chevron with three cranes upon on the name Cranmer, paired with the newsmark shield aligning themselves in pride with ancient ancestry. Perhaps the mixed message on Thomas Sr.'s tomb represented the family's own mixed feeling about their place in society. They were an old family, yes, but with little wealth or distinction. When Thomas became archbishop, he designed his own shield in keeping with tradition. He changed his family's imagery from cranes to pelicans. According to legend, the pelicans shed their own blood to feed their young. This symbol of Christ reflected the position Cranmer embraced the new office. It also foreshadowed his own death. At the time Cranmer's appointment, Henry VIII said in an understatement, you are likely to be tested if you take stand your tackling at strength. Cranmer also added three cinquefoils from his mother's arms and, and a crescent, symbol of a younger son. The shield was impaled or paired with the shield of the Sea of Canterbury. For his signet ring, the seal was used for official papers. Cranmer kept the old family design with no crescent. After Thomas Sr.'s death, the estate could support only one of the children, and so it passed to Thomas' old, eldest brother, John. The medieval first-born winner-take-all practice of primogeniture kept the estate from being parceled away over the centuries, while at the same time providing the church and the army with an influx of talent from among the second sons of the nobility, which is what happened to the young Thomas. Before he died, Thomas Sr. felt it important to provide an education for both younger sons, Thomas and Edmund, so that they could enter the ranks of the clergy. He left them each with a small annual allowance. A very young Thomas probably started at the local village school then progressed to the grammar school where he was beaten into quiet submission by a cruel schoolmaster, a quote-unquote rude parish clerk in that barbarous time, closed quote. The history of education is dotted with the image of young boys wrapped on the knuckles, bullied by tyrannical teachers and Cranmer's story seems to be one more of to be one more case of an early lesson in survival. The story later told by Cranmer's secretary, that would be Ralph Maurice, addresses Cranmer's mild and unargumentative personality, suggesting this as a result of the cruel treatment at school. Cranmer grew into a timid man. Cranmer's schoulmaster, so appalled, dulled, and daunted the tender and fine minds of his scholars that they ended up hating literature, losing both mem memory and natural audacity in the face of such treatment. While Thomas' father was still alive, he encouraged the young boy to pursue other pursuits than studying raising him to be a proper English gentleman. He took Thomas hunting and hawking and to pro provided for him to ride even the roughest horses. 
This training stood Thomas in good stead when he became an archbishop. A good horseman, he could ride with the best, taking time and occasion to enjoy the recreational sports of hunting and hawking. He killed deer with a crossbow, even when his sight was failing. In 1503, at age 14, Cranmer went to Cambridge to study at Jesus College. The family decision to send him there must have been made in the face of social and family interests. Two of Cranmer's relatives by marriage chose to attend the rival school out of Oxford, and two of his other friends, Christopher Tamworth and Robert Clifton, went to different colleges at Cambridge. However, two of Cranmer's young contemporaries from Lincolnshire, Thomas Goodrich and John Whitwell, decided to attend Jesus College as well, which may have had a bearing on Cranmer's decision. Remaining lifelong friends, the three of them rose in the clergy ranks together, Goodrich becoming Bishop of Eli and Lord Chancellor and Whitwell while serving as Cranmer's personal chaplain throughout his years as an archbishop. In the early 1500s, benefactors competed to establish new colleges in the two centers of learning, Oxford and Cambridge. In 1494 or 95, Lady Margaret Beaufort, mother of Henry VII, met with John Fisher later Bishop of Rochester, over a meal. During that meal, she asked him to be her spiritual guide, and he convinced her to become involved in the future of Cambridge. Thus began a col fruitful collaboration of the two benefactors. In 1496, the last of the nuns departed the Benedictine Covenant of St. Mary and St. Radigan, east of Cambridge. According to tradition, the nuns had gained a reputation for lascivious living. With a small endowment, the bishop established Jesus College on the convent's spacious grounds. The nuns' refectory became the college hall. The former prioress's lodging became the master lodge, and the bishop of Eli modified and reduced the chapel in scale. By 1503, the year Thomas arrived at Cambridge, John Fisher had become vice chancellor, and he and Lady Margaret were already set on a course to make Cambridge, including John College, a leader of all Northern Europe in humanistic learning. In Cranmer's first years at Jesus College, they financed the refurbishing and upgrading of the college. Lady Margaret made annual visits, and on her last one, she brought along her young son, King Henry VII, and her grandson, Prince Henry, to the university commencement with her. Cranmer began his studies for the Bachelor of Arts in 1503, moving from the Cranmer holdings in the mound where he used to gaze over the garden gardens on his family's estate to Cambridge, living in the refurbished nun's convent, surrounding, surrounded by spacious grounds of field and forest. He was entering a new world and a changing one. Here ends chapter one. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Godspeed.